awesome. Thanks for hanging out for a minute. Yeah. Talk. Yeah, we grabbed the, the outdoor room here. <laughs> I, I feel like we're in northern crazy. Wisconsin right now. Yeah, I feel like there should be a nice little fire crackling. We need that. We need marshmallows, beer. Dude, We'd be good. <laughs> you hear like some squirrels running around. And hanging out. So you, you know, the other night we were talking a little bit about how, you know, you've taken, you've obviously been the leader for growth driven design and kind of coining that concept and growing it. And there's a lot of influencers, even you mentioned like Tim Ferriss and other people that have had a big influence on your life, but also um, other things. So I'd say just, you know, if you want, just kind of like, what are you into, man? Like, what, mm-hmm. what do you like to do when you're not, when you're not uh, kind of working on that or even while you're working on that? Like, yeah, you just walk through uh, a abnormal or normal week. I think it's pretty much all abnormal is yeah, usually I what it say. is. <laughs> there's, a, <laughs> there's not such a thing as normal week. Um, so, uh, you know, kind of my, my normal routines, of course, I got work and then I got uh, the other big things I'm into is uh, I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and um, Judo and kickboxing and all that. I've been doing it for 10 years and uh, absolutely love that. Uh, but one of the things I, I really try and do is I'm very like super OCD about I have to always be learning something new. Um, a lot of times that just comes in the form of like reading books. It could be, you know, like. I don't. I, I never gotten into again. People, don't hit me. But I'll, I never got into Game of Thrones. I never got into any of that. So what I do when I go home instead of that, I, I like totally nerd out and watch like TED talks, or I watch uh, conferences, or I you know I, I watch um, like recorded workshops, anything I can get my hands on. And the the I think the reason is is that I'm always looking for how do I improve my life. And once I've kind of vetted some of those things out on my life, how do I go and helpfully improve other people's life with some of the things that I'm doing? So. Um, just kind of like in this constant hunger for for learning and and um, and growing and adapting. Sure, yeah. absolutely. So how do you go through? There's there's obviously like, I mean, knowledge is like there's an endless that could be an, and it's an endless pursuit. Yeah. So how do you gauge kind of what types of knowledge you're going after and and how potentially some knowledge may complement other knowledge and, and how you can see those two or like how, how are you even deciding what to pursue or even what to research yeah uh, I think it's like any, anything in life uh, whether you're we're talking about what, what do I want to learn what kind of job should I get where should I move um, a lot of times we we just kind of we don't start with the end with the with the kind of the end destination in mind or the reason that we're doing certain things in mind and so i think one of the things to help is first get a crystal clear idea of like what gets you excited to get out of bed every morning what are you trying to what kind of impact are you trying to make on this world and what that does is that kind of gives you at least like a little bit of a a lens or a filter so once you have that kind of idea of like here's the impact i want to make on the world uh, and this kind of just goes into life in general. You then think about, okay, um, what are the different vehicles that I could do that? And what, what do I want to be doing in the next year to two years to get me closer to whatever big impact I'm trying to make? And all those things kind of work as like a filter so that I can start prioritizing um, and make it very, very crystal clear whether something aligns with that or not. If I know that specifically I'm here to help uh, you know, this is not mine. I'm just using it as an example. If I'm specifically here, I wake up excited every day to try and help improve the health um, and, and overall being of, of my friends, my family, my, my people, that all of a sudden gives you a very clear filter on how to make decisions in this world. You know what types of like what types of thing, activities you should be doing on the weekend and do they align with me helping my friends, family, and myself become healthier and more well-being? And if not, Okay, well that's that's cool. That's not my thing. Or what should I be learning? You know that really puts a lens on if that's if that's your filter. Um, what kind of cooking should you be trying to do? What kinds of um, you know should you be having a, a garden to have all your stuff um, homegrown? And really, what all of those things are, they're like kind of the physical um, representations of you, physical representations that are manifested in your life of the ways that you go about bringing that vision to reality right and the things you surround yourself should all like that but if you don't know why you get out of bed every morning if you don't know kind of like 
what the path is that you're you're trying to that end destination that end goal of where I want to be in three years or two years, um, which are heavy questions and of course they change. But at least you need some kind of guideline or some kind of fuzzy box to play within. Uh, that really um, you really need to take think about those things. So once a year I do that. I, I kind of reassess where I want to be in three years. Um, kind of do a gut check on what gets me out of bed every morning and. Um, and help kind of basically plan out, okay, what do the next three months look like uh, to get me to that end destination? So it's a very long-winded answer no, to, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, your original question was like, well, how do you know what you want to learn? Yeah. Um, I started like, out with all of that framework and then it makes it very clear like, okay, uh, you know, I want to be specifically le- looking at this, these particular things. So this is an area that is going to help me accomplish my, my why or my reason for getting out of bed that I don't know about yet. And so maybe I should spend some time there. Um, and so that's kind of how I, how I think about where I spend my time and how I spend my time. And in this case, what do I try to learn? That's cool. That makes awesome. sense. So what, what exactly does get you out of bed in the morning? Like as you look at your three-year goal, mm. kind of how, how is that, what is that shaped like right now? Yeah, yeah. So the, my, the reason I get out of bed every morning is to help uh, inspire other people so that they can hit their peak performance. Um, and uh, because I feel like uh, humans are such incredible creatures that you think about the things that we've built over time and all the things and the impact we can make in other people's lives and all the things we can do but uh, we only hear the stories of kind of like the select few that are doing these really big things and I think what ends up happening is people don't think that they they have that power they could change the world and they kind of like are hard on themselves and I think they I think humans can do amazing things and so I think what I'm trying to do is help inspire those people to realize that in themselves and um, and find good ways to set themselves up for success for growing for helping make whatever that impact is that they want to make and so you know, when I look at if that's kind of the reason I get out of bed, for me, you know, there's a couple ways I could do that. I could work with an individual person and make that impact in that person's life. I could, I could make, try and make impact in multiple people's lives. For me personally, I'm trying to create the biggest megaphone possible so that I can try and affect as many people uh, as possible. It's, it's more of a breadth versus depth, right? You, I could work with one person and really, really go in depth with helping that person. Sure. Or I can try and plant the seed in a million people and then hopefully it, it, it helps they keep nurturing that seed until it affects their lives. But uh, for me, it's that finding that big megaphone. So when I look at, with, if that's kind of my like guiding lens of how I view the things I should be doing, if it doesn't, if it doesn't help inspire other people, it doesn't help me build a bigger megaphone um, and it doesn't make an impact on someone else's life, it makes it very easy for me to say like, that's cool, but that's not for me, that's for someone else. And so... Each year when I plan out my goals, I say, okay, where I'm at today and then what kind of like quote unquote megaphone or audience or whatever do I need to be in three years? And then I kind of reverse engineer it to figure out like, okay, what do I got to do this year? What do I got to do in the next three months? Um, that's so that's cool. kind of how I think about it. That's awesome. I like that a lot. So let's take a task like email for an example. That's email sucks. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely like, hate it. <laughs> it's so bad. Yeah. But I, mean, I would argue even with even as, as high, you know, as you're becoming more and more of a thought leader, your time, insight, et cetera, whatever is becoming in a much higher demand, even amongst all the partners, all that kind of stuff, amongst HubSpot people, everything. So how do you, but at the same time, you're still relatively good at responding to email and getting back with people and remembering to do that. So how do you take, and you can use that and go as specific as you want with email, or you could just take that as an example and say like, how do you take tasks that just frankly suck but are like necessary yeah, yeah, to like re-engineer them to match your life. So again, take that question however you want. I'll, I'll use email because I think, yeah. I think <laughs> both of us and probably you watching uh, both deal with email. And um, so the way, the problem with email is that, and it's even worse now with Slack um, and like some of the messaging apps and stuff like that and Twitter, is that we feel like there's some type of sense of urgency that we need to respond right away. Someone, like we're in such a like instant gratification culture that if we shoot an email off to someone, we kind of expect an email back right away. But the reality is is that, you know, like the word's not gonna burn, and the, the building's not gonna explode if, if it takes you a little bit of time to, to respond at, at certain times. And so I think the first thing is, I mean, the, if we're talking tactical, the first thing is like set up a, a all your filters to kind of filter out all the stuff that really just isn't doesn't matter right the distracting stuff all that the stuff that you know is just kind of cluttering up your inbox 
I think the second thing is, so this comes from the Getting Things Done book, which is real famous. It's kind of written back in the 80s, so it's all applied to you know, more paperwork related stuff, but you can use that same system for email. So I'll put in, basically when I, when I do check my email, and I try and check it just certain blocks of the day. So I have an, uh, an hour in the morning and an hour in the afternoon blocked off where that's when I open up my email and I take a look at it. Um, I don't always stick to that, but I try and, try and do it the best I can. Um, and outside of that, I just close my email and hopefully you know, focus on my other stuff. Uh, during those times, I look and I say, is this something that I can respond to in under two minutes? Cool, then I'll just crank out a quick email, usually it's like a sentence or two, and I'll just get all those out of the way. Uh, then I'll go and look at, okay, I got all those out. What are the ones that are um, basically urgent or immediate and what are ones that I can follow up with later? Like sometimes someone's just requesting a link or something like that. You, you, it's not something that I need to respond to right away. Yeah. So in that case, uh, I'll just dump it into a folder. Uh, or it's called respond to later. I'll dump it in a folder and um, I'll essentially do that kind of email um, you know, whenever I have a little bit more downtime or when I'm kind of in a, you know, I, I really try and structure my day around the way I know my brain works. You know, in the morning, I'm in some kind of mode. I'm very much a uh, heads down worker. So I try and uh, really focus on heads down stuff. I try and push all my meetings to the afternoon because in the afternoon, I, I, know my, I know my brain works better with collaboration and working with other people. And so when I look at where I schedule those email blocks, I try and schedule them in times when I know that I'm that type of a task fits with what my normal kind of mindset is at that time sure. of the day. So I'll dump all those non-essential, non-urgent ones in the side and then whatever's left, I'll just start cranking away. When I, when I run out of time, I run out of time. So I think if you were looking at for some kind of like framework uh, is first kind of look at like, you know, this comes from the seven habits of highly effective people. You say like, is this something that's, that's urgent and important? Okay, those are the ones where you should focus your time. Is it, is it not urgent and important? That's, some, that's kind of like, okay, put that in your backlog. We're gonna take a look at that when we get some downtime. Then there's, you know, not urgent, not important. That's the stuff you just disregard. <laughs> And then you have, um, you know, urgent, not important. And again, that's kind of the stuff that you can, you can assess kind of on a case by case basis. So I think you kind of have to mentally start going through those filters and see what is, what is really where, where you need to spend your time and, and energy and things like that. So um, the other way you can do it too, I used to do this is I'll tag email based off of um, kind of like, cause I commute. So every day I commute an hour or a, a half hour and I'm on the subway. And so I'll, if there's email I know I can just crank through while I'm out on the subway, I'll just tag it with like subway. And then that's my like to do as I'm on the subway is just cranking through all those responses and things like that. So with with getting into like um, the, so you you talked about some other, some other cool things like sensory deprivation tanks and I know you've done some meditation things. So what are, what are maybe three, and they could be things you've already talked about totally or they could be like really obscure things. Mm -hmm. Um, that you haven't shared about. What are three things that you feel like you've tested and either it panned out to be really awesome where you're like, wow, this is something I want to ingrain into my life now? Yeah. Or it was just like something that, it could be one where it's just like, dude, I am never doing that ever again. <laughs> you know, it's like such a not fun experiment. Uh, yeah. I'm so glad I never did that, do that again. Yeah, so the one the one hands down that I think everyone should do is is meditation every morning. Um, I do 20 minutes every morning, been doing it for about a year and a half. And it's like we have so many things going through our brain and, you know, we have our cell phones and we have email and we have these big challenges we're running into and all of that. And it's, we, we fall asleep, but even then our brain's still kind of going. And um, so one of the benefits of meditation is it's kind of like a reset button. And I'm not into like the, all the woo woo, you know, kind of like spiritual. I mean, it's cool. It's just not my thing. I do it more in, in the practical sense that I, I see a performance and mind mindfulness boost from doing meditation. And so every morning it's just, you get such a good reset button where you're, it feels like you're starting with a clean slate. Um, I think when you have so many things going on and your brain's always going, you know, a lot of type A personalities are always going, their yeah. brain's never shutting off. It's like you're always feeling like you're trying to pull yourself out of quicksand and uh, having that meditation allows you to just feel like you got stable ground uh, totally. to start your day off with, which is cool. How does that look for you, by the way? So, so hypothetically, you get out of bed, you splash water in your face. When it comes time to do your meditation, what is that? 
process? Like, yeah, yeah. What's the routine? I think the hardest part is, is I think people feel like they have to do like right out of the gate 20 minutes. Um, and you really, I think if you try and do that, you're, you're going to do it for a couple, couple days and then you're just going to be like, all right, I, I don't have time for 20 minutes. I got to do this. I got to do that. So I'm very much like start with a more than achievable, um, something that's more than achievable for you. So if you think you can do five minutes, do four minutes to start for the first week or two. And once you feel comfortable there, then you can increase it. So what I actually did when I started, um, I tried to just do long sessions, didn't work. So I actually just picked... Um, even though, you know, and typically you, you try and sit in silence so you can focus on breathing and, and mindfulness, um, I actually just started by putting on uh, one song that I felt was very calming and relaxing to me. And the song was like four minutes. So I knew if I just sat, it kind of had the start and the end. I knew if I just sat for the, for the four minutes through the song, I'd be good. And then after a couple weeks of that, that was no problem. was enjoying that. M added another song to the playlist and then another song. And soon I had a 20 minutes worth of uh, music. And so, and it was just calm, relaxing music. And then I switched and started, then every week I would decrease the volume. So the volume got quieter and quieter and quieter. So that eventually after like, after six or eight weeks, it was like, or even, even you know, a couple months, uh, it got to the point where I just didn't need the music to be able to, to comfortably sit. Because I get a lot of times people are like, well, I'm antsy, I got ADD, I got all this stuff. And uh, that was a way for me to slowly ease into it. Uh, there's also a lot of, there's two apps, Calm and then Headspace. Those are good, um, they're kind of guided meditation, so they kind of talk you through um, some of the breathing stuff, and it's another good way to slowly ease yourself into that. And, um, you know, there's really no, you know, I think when we think meditation, you think someone like floating on a cloud at the top of a mountain and all this. There's no right or wrong way to do it. Like literally, we could just be sitting, I could be sitting in a chair like this with my back against the chair in a relaxed position. And, um sure and be able to do it. It's really more about being able to separate your thoughts from uh, from your actual perception and be able to just like be really conscious and mindful of the things you're thinking. So that's kind of the second benefit. Um, and this is a, a long-winded answer. I'm very long-winded. That's your long-winded answer to this question. No, no, that's great. Um, it's the, the practice of doing 20 minutes every morning to become more mindful to um, pay attention to your thoughts to kind of draw yourself back in from your brain starts going in all these crazy directions and that's okay. The point when you first start out with meditation is not to try and not let it go into those directions. It's okay if those goes in the directions. It's to be mindful that, hey, I am in these directions. Let's pull me back in. And so that activity of noticing your mind's out here and pulling it back into your breath, that's what you, when you first start, is what you're trying to train. The cool thing is, is that translates into other parts of your life. So I'll, I'll now be in meetings and, you know, something, something frustrating is happening, something, you know, it's a bad situation, we're doing all this, instead of like immediately having a, an instant reaction to that and really flying off the handle of doing that, it allows me to, I can tell when my brain starts going in that direction before just acting on that instinct, I can be mindful on what I'm thinking, kind of draw myself back in. So um, I found that it's really helped with translating to other parts of my life, um, which so, that would be one activity that I think is, is really, really beneficial that, um, you know, I started out by just saying, let's do this for like a month and see how it goes. And, um, you know, it's really something that stuck with me as, as that's something cool. that's really good. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. It's kind of just like that, yeah, just being still for a moment and like not listening to anything and like the power that that can. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so just, cool. it's just you and your thoughts. Um, cool. so, and, and then the, the, to, talk about the sensory deprivation tank so that's kind of like taking that one step further so now not only are we not only are we sitting mindful with just our thoughts it's like we're cutting out all the sensory stuff on top of that and you know making sure cell phones not in arms reach and all of that <laughs> stuff um, so I think that that's kind of um, I would highly recommend it I would definitely recommend doing it at least committing to doing it at least two or three times because the first time you're just kind of like okay this is kind of weird how do I relax yeah like you're kind of tense and by the second or third time you do it you can like really relax a lot better so <coughs> that's awesome. so that that's one thing I would definitely um, I would definitely recommend that's cool is there anything else that, that you've done you kind of already said it too with email batching and like how you kind of handle that um, is there anything else that you've done that you've said like wow the improvements or the impact that this has had on my life has been significant at least enough to even mention yeah, yeah. I think just getting in a good morning routine and that part meditation is part of that. Um, the other thing, 
you know, the, the, here's a, here's an actually. I, okay, so let me finish that thought, and then I'll I'll move on to another idea. So just getting in a good morning routine uh, where you know you take away a lot of the normal decisions. There's this whole idea of decision fatigue. The more decisions you have to make, of like what to wear. Oh, it's raining. Oh, should I wear this? Oh, what should I eat for breakfast? What should I do this? It's like you're kind of starting. You're already exhausting your the amount of decisions uh, that you're making right out of the gate. Um, and so. Uh, Taking away all that variability, making very, very clear, you know, having a very clear routine. Um, so, uh, one of the things that I integrate in my, my routine is um, finishing every, you know, when I shower in the morning, I do a hot shower, and then I finish everyone with like uh, basically a minute to two minutes of like ice cold, as cold as I can get it. And it's like total shock to the system, totally wakes you up. Uh, gets the blood flowing and I'll alternate. So then once I'm in there for two minutes, then I'll flip it back to hot. Hot water comes on, of course it feels great, and gets the blood flowing there. I think that that's an interesting exercise for a few reasons. One, just the physiological like stimulus right in the morning, get your wake up. It's like, a, you, it's like a doing a shot of espresso right away. You're like, whoa. Uh, so that's awesome. I think the other thing that it does is when I first started uh, doing it, and this is a good exercise for everyone, um, I have this idea of like, we, we live in our little, we live in our, our safe environment, right? So the things that we do, the, most of the time we feel comfortable in what we're doing because we feel safe. Then like over here, we have, okay, we do things in life that are dangerous, like that, that fatal or will kill us, right? But there's some place in between. And so there's the safe world, there's the fatal world, and then there's the like, okay, this is scary, but it's exciting. And my thesis is that we, we always need to be living in that world. And we're going to start in the safe world. And when we're kids, like we're, we're exploring the world and we're, we're getting hurt and we're probably more here. But as we get older, we don't like living in that world anymore. And we, we slowly migrate back into what feels safe and comfortable and not doing anything crazy. And we, we kind of get into the routines. But the problem with that is you, st you, stop, you stagnate and you stop growing. And so you need to look for activities in your life that will help push you from that safe zone into the exciting and scared feeling zone. Uh, not fatal, hopefully, but like the exciting zone. And as you're in that zone more and more, that safety zone starts to expand. And then from there, you have to take the next step and you, you, you start um, living in that scary and exciting zone. So the example is, if we put it to a real example, and I'll tie this back to uh, the cold showers is when I, so Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, uh, when I started it was white belt. So I go to competitions, I compete in white belt and that was my not safe zone. I was used to practice, tournaments were like a whole different deal. So I was living in that, okay, this is scary, but exciting. And at a certain point after a certain amount of tournaments, you know, for any of anyone who does sports competitions, I'm sure this is, for, you can all relate. Once you've been in that white zone or that white belt tournament and that scary zone long enough, like white belt tournaments, Felt pretty comfortable to me like I was doing well I started winning like that was cool so as a white belt uh, you can't do that so much anymore but back in the day you used to be able to be a white belt and jump up to the blue belt division so now I'm a white belt competing with all the blue belts so now I'm back into that scary this is kind of like scared but exciting and I got nothing to lose but I'm gonna learn and and I started competing and eventually started doing really well as a white belt in the blue belt division and eventually got my blue belt and so then I would do that from blue to purple. And so it's just as we push ourselves into that scared but exciting zone, you know, it's gonna be it's gonna be scary, but really that's what it takes for us to grow. So the reason that I think the cold showers exercise is good is that's a very very easy and quick way to start pushing yourself outside your comfort zone. When I first started, I'd turn the cold water on and I'd be like, ah, and like I'd have to like ease in with just my arm, and then I'd have to like and try and relax and um, and then the next day it was a little better and the bell better. And after a few months of that, you started to stop fearing this cold water. You're like, okay, this cold water is not a big deal. I can just turn it on and I don't blink and I just am, am, am very comfortable. And so I think that's a very good, um, not only is it good for the physiological like stimulus of like waking you up and all that, but I think it's also a good exercise to help like reinforce in a small way that, okay, this at first was really cold and scary, like we hated it, it was bad, but eventually you can get used to it. And if you can overcome that, like how can you apply that same idea to other parts of your life uh, and get more comfortable about public speaking, get more comfortable about, um, you know, calling people up on the phone. We're so scared to call people on the phone these days, um, you know, and trying to get over some of your fears and just using that exercise in the morning uh, and make it part of your morning routine 
um, to help kind of illustrate some of that stuff. So you want to just go over like maybe what are some books that you're reading right now or, or, or rather even if it's not right now, like what are maybe like two top books that you're like, look, if you have time, like just, or <laughs> not maybe just, Make the time. Make the to time. Read these two books, or right? Or listen to them on audio, or however you want to consume them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so this goes back to when I talked about how I plan my life. It all comes down to like figuring out first why do you get out of bed. Um, and so the book uh, "Start with Why" by Simon Sinek is uh, been hands down um, my absolute favorite. The one I recommend the most. Um, it's written in a business context, so if you're a business owner, you'll probably love it even more. If you're not in business or marketing. Uh, you have to listen to the book, l learn, kind of listen to how he's laying out the framework and then take that in. You can really apply that framework to your personal life. You can apply it to your professional life, to your family, um, to your hobbies. Um, so I think you have to kind of just listen to it and just anytime they say business, re in your brain replace the word business with myself and apply it to yourself. But that's been one that I think, <laughs> I read it. Um, got literally got done went straight to a, a sushi bar got like two bottles of sake and just slammed sake while i was writing in a journal for like four hours straight so it was super cool um that was i guess the, the word epiphany would be i guess accurate to describe uh how it made a lot of things that were fuzzy in my life become cl pretty clear so that would be one i would recommend uh another one that i recommend a lot but it's more Again, it's written in the business context. You can apply it to anything. It's called Pitch Anything by this guy, uh, Oren Claff. And so what Oren does is he gets hired by businesses, by startups, or by developer, like um, property developers, to go pitch to VCs to raise funding. But the book is really about how do you pitch an idea. And so that idea could be yourself for a job, for a job interview. It could be yourself for a promotion. It could be, you know, if you are in business, like how do you pitch for a, a deal? And he has a very good uh, framework that's based off of psychology and how people interpret things um, and how they behave. And I, so I think that, I think just learning how to communicate your ideas and, um, and having a practical framework for talking about them uh, and how to deal with when someone comes back at you with certain questions or things. Uh, that book's been one that I've recommended recommended a ton. So I like that one. What 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 would be a couple of things for those that are younger or whatever else that like you could if you could go back and tell your twenty one year old self what would be a couple of those things that you'd be like, hey, bro, <laughs> you gotta do this. Yeah. Or whatever else. Yeah. It, uh, it, the first one would be for sure um, get into reading because, you know, in high school, I, I high school and middle school I was never into reading. It was like one of those things where they just like it was like pulling teeth to get me to read. I'd find the cliff notes and just do anything I could do to try and avoid actually reading it. And that then I really got hooked into learning just in general, but learning through online courses and through, you know, that kind of thing. And uh Eventually, at some point, uh, Audible came out, and I got hooked on Audible. And Audible was an awesome way for me to be able to, to quote unquote, read, um, but in a, a more, uh, an easier way to digest. Like I, I, you know, I'm all over the place, so for me to sit down and actually read a book at the time was really hard. But if I'm listening to Audible, I can do it on my commute, so I'm not, you know, I'm still doing something that's kind of mindless in terms of not driving, but like riding on the subway. And I could be listening at the same time, and that was easy for me to do. That's also now translated into I really enjoy reading actual paperback books. So the reason I would recommend that is I think like you think of a book and what that is. This is someone who spent years of their life learning something, and instead of them and them going through all these hardships, all these ideas, all these things that worked and didn't work, and they took all of that and put it in a book. And now they're giving you that to save you from having to go through all that time and energy and shit like that. So I look at it as every book I read is like accelerating my, like saving me time and energy from having to learn that shit out for myself from scratch. Um, and, you know, of course I, I'm going to have learning after that, but at least it's like helping accelerate that. So that would be one thing. I think the other thing is, and this is something I'm, I'm I, I recently moved to Boston and I'm kind of struggling with because I'm having to like 
remake new friends and all that. But um, you know, there's that as cliche as it is, it's like you're the sum of the five people you surround yourself with. And oh, yeah. when I look back at 21, uh, hopefully none of my friends watch this. I lo love you guys to death. Um, <laughs> they were good, but they were good for partying, for the social life. And I did learn a lot of social lessons uh, as well, communication and social and stuff like that. So I do value uh, having those experiences then. But um, I think I could have done a better balance of surrounding myself, having that group of friends for social and party and other friends that could help me in other things that were more meaningful in my life. I think I, I surrounded myself with only people that wanted to party and go out and all that. And, um, you know, at the time it felt good. But looking back, it's like, um, you know, I think that that slowed down what I should have really been focusing on. Cool. And I think the other thing is uh, move out of my bubble in my hometown quicker. Like I, I finally, it took me to be 27 before I finally pulled the trigger and moved outside of my hometown. Not that it's for everyone, but looking back for myself, I think I would have told you that. Um, it's just, we, again, it goes into that, I feel safe yeah. and I don't want to get outside my safe, safe zone. Sure. But I think I've learned so much from moving and uh, the thing is you can always go back. I can always go back. If things go wrong, I can always go back. And so um, I'd, I'd probably encourage myself to get outside of my normal little bubble way earlier on to experience more. Not to experience more of the world because I, I had been traveling already, but more um, pursue opportunities that are outside of your little hometown bubble because there's a lot of opportunities out there. Totally. That's awesome. So if anyone watching wants to get a hold of you or contact you in some way, what would be some of the best mediums to do? I know you yeah. mentioned you have a website and stuff like that. And you got some plans with that? Yeah. Yeah, the easiest is just uh, you can go to you can Google Luke Summerfield um, or LukeSummerfield.com. You can hit me up on Twitter at Savvy, S-A-V-V, two Vs, Y, Luke, uh, Savvy Luke, or... Um, you know, you can email me, Luke at LukeSummerfield.com. It's easy too. So, yeah, I'm pretty accessible. Thanks, so, dude. This cool. is awesome. This awesome. is so much fun. Yeah, appreciate uh, it. Thanks for asking me. Yeah, definitely. All right, cheers.